right now. Hey, everybody, it's Monday, and look who's here. It's Steve Oh, Lillywag. hello there, Andrew Jeps. <laughs> Again, hello. for part and five. And hello. Mark Abrams <laughs> joining us for the entire program because That's right. we finally made it through my copious notes, and now it is question time. Question time, which is a British television show, yes. as you know. Yes. Well, <laughs> I'd like to point out to everybody watching that uh, because you're on the equator and we are not, our clocks have changed. Yours have not. It is now two thirty in the morning, not one thirty. It's now two forty forty one in the morning. Two forty one. Good God! So, so we're gonna just get straight to it, and we'll get have you for as it. long as you can take it. How's that sound? Okay. Oh, thank you so much. I, I, I will try, and uh, certainly I will do an hour for you, and we can. Um, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. So that's time for like one and a half questions, then. Oh, you know what I'm like. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I do. Well, shall we? <laughs> shall we get the first one from Mark? Let's get the first one from Mark. Hit me, Mark. Okay. All right. Well, uh, our good friend in the chat room, uh, Jason, reminded us that we need to hear the story of riding in the car with the drummer from Fish. Oh, my Lord. Okay. Riding in the car. Well, I never rode in the car with the drummer of Fish. Uh, hi, Jason. Steve Lillywhite reporting for duty. We were recording a, a, a very good Fish album called Billy Breathes in the wilds of Woodstock, upstate New York, in a, in a wonderful, wonderful studio called Bearsville. This was in the crazy days of, um, of all excess. And it was fantastic. You know, uh, the, the eye never came off the prize, which was great music. You know, and, um, and, and as, long, as long as the eye doesn't come off that prize, the, the, the lifestyle, you know, I, I don't judge. And of course, I was just as bad as everyone else. And um, we were told that John Fishman was uh, was was going to. Um, he he walked into the studio one day and says, "Guys, I'm going to be gone for a couple of days. I am um, I'm going to New Orleans to to pick up a pound of opium." <laughs> So I said, oh, right, fantastic. Okay, so he gets in the car, we carry on doing our thing. He drives down, we get, a, we get you know, no cell phones in those days. Uh, we get a phone call, I'm here, I'm doing the pickup. You know, he drove literally from upstate New York to New Orleans, he picked up the stuff, he put it in his car, and, um, and, then, and then got back in his car, and then drove, and, and he would stop off at a motel, just to make a phone call. He hadn't slept, didn't do any sleeping this whole time. He gets within half an hour of Bearsville, he gets to Kingston, New York, which is, um, and he just, he's so tired, he can't drive the final half an hour. So he just stops the car and checks into a motel and he sleeps for like a day and a half. And, we, and we're going, oh, come on, come on, come on. We want to try this opium. It's, I bet. So the idea of a pound of opium on a fish recording session, you know, all bets are off. It's going to be fantastic because that's how we <laughs> rolled in those days. So um, he eventually wakes up, comes to the studio, puts this opium on the on the desk. Pound. I mean, a pound is a lot. And we smell it. It smells good. We start crumbling it up and smoking it. And we more. And then what really doesn't do much at all. It was just, actually, it was just a complete waste of time. Uh, and, and he got completely ripped off. But word had got round about this fantastic car trip to get the opium. And there was a man called Evan Dando working in another studio in Woodstock. And he'd obviously had a lot more luck with his... Um, with whatever he was on, but I knew Evan Dando. He's a beautiful, lovely man, and um, and I've parted with him on three continents now. I remember I've parted with him in <laughs> Australia, America, and the UK. And he's up for anything. He's a fantastic guy, and uh, so he heard word that the opium was there. Anyway, he came over, and we like you know, hi Evan. This is this is uh, Fish and Trey and the boys. Evan Dando was in a band called the Lemonheads who had a hit record with a version, cover version of Mrs. Robinson. Anyway, and a, a sort of a punk rock version of Mrs. Robinson. 
Simon and Garfunkel. So we played him one of our songs and he's like, like this drunk, you know, and we said, uh, have you got anything that you're working on? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gets a cassette out and he hands it to the assistant and the assistant puts the cassette in the machine and we start listening to it. And it's some sort of, you know, it, it was probably the sort of music that when you're sober, you, you, you tell people this is going to surprise a lot of people. Well, <laughs> no. Because it, you know what I'm saying, Andrew. <laughs> no, it's not going to surprise anyone because it, it, it's not that great. But anyway, he puts it on and it was, it, it was just stoned sort of jamming. Anyway, but he suddenly like the music goes on and he gets this thing and he starts putting his fingers on the faders of the mixing desk and he tries to, um, and he tries to mix his own cassette. Now, anyone who's listening to this realizes that a cassette is a two track and normally plugged into the output of the mixing desk, therefore nullifying anything that the faders might be possibly doing. But he didn't notice this. He was like mixing it and he felt that he was mixing it. And he was pushing the faders up and down, <laughs> thinking that what he was hearing was happening. And, Meanwhile, and screwing up your thing. balance completely. Yeah, yeah well, exactly. You know, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've just realized, Andrew, this is a bit of a free lunch for you, this, isn't it? Because yeah. Mark is going to be asking the questions and I'm giving the answers. Yeah, I'm just sitting here with my cat. That's it. Oh, right. How is your pussy? Mole is, mole is fantastic here. I mean, uh, no, 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 too low. No, no friends. I don't want to see, your, I don't want to see your penis. Mole I do mind. not want to see I would like to go to my grave never having seen Andrew Shepson's penis. I think, I think we can arrange that. <laughs> that probably, close call. Yeah, yeah. That will probably be the case. Exactly. Okay, so anyway, that's it's a silly question. I loved working with Fish and uh, we're all sober now and uh and and you know and I work with them again and 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 Trey Trey one of the master craftsmen. Mm. He looks like Chuck Norris, but it's so weird, isn't it? Trey looks like yeah, but anyway, that's another thing. He's lovely. Excellent. Next question. All right. Okay. All right. Next question. So actually to go off of that, uh, I have to find it here. Hold on one second. Wow. You guys are submitting questions fast. Um, I just lost my place. So let's see. Well, uh, I will find who asked this question in a minute, but I remember it. Um, could you describe a typical day in the studio of how you like to work? So what would sort of timeline oh. be like and how you like to run the day? Okay, um, obviously, being uh, a man who has always got his synapses going towards uh, the best way to make a record, not how I make a record, the best way to make a record with this artist, I try first off to think, do they do, you know, if I, I never say I do it this way because, you know, I am a vehicle for their music. I am the person who, who basically has to mold himself. So, so if, um, if it was, say, the Rolling Stones, who I work with, nothing, we never bothered to get to the studio till about one o'clock in the morning because basically nothing would happen until Keith Richards arrived. So one o'clock in the morning, that was one way of things. When I work with the Talking Heads, I think I told the story of the of the guitarist who came in, who wasn't the guitarist, yeah. who was the messenger boy. He uh, that we started at ten o'clock in the morning. So to start with, it's all down to the art. You know, we look and we talk and we say, okay, how do we do it? Um, I, I mean, let's take an album along the, the whole of an album, rather, a rather than a typical day. I, I try and make sure that there are no surprises down the line, and I try and look for any problems that might occur. And one thing, Andrew will agree with me, one thing that, that having empathy for a recording studio environment gives you is the ability to sometimes, given a good tailwind, sometimes be able to see a problem before it appears, you know? So therefore you, you learn how to, how to steer the session sometimes without anyone even thinking that you're steering it because, mm. you know, you, 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 you don't, you, you, you steer it in a way that 
it just seems like a natural thing to do. So, you know, for instance, if, you know, I, I realized very early on that if you get all your backing tracks done and then it's like, because a guitarist can do all, probably all his parts in a block of time, he could do that. A singer very much can't. Simple thing like that. So try and get the singer to do his bits a bit at a time. You know, so as the record goes on, you, the last thing you want to do is to finish all the music and go to the singer. Okay, now it's your turn. It's like, oh my God, I've got a mountain to climb. Yeah. The 90% of this album is actually not done yet because as much as a bass drum sound matters, it fucking really doesn't. You know, you've got, to, and, and a very simple thing that I, when I was a, a, a tape op and an assistant back in the day, I remember listening to music and making records and really getting into the music. And, and then when it was time for the singer to do his singing, I went, oh, I liked it as an instrumental better. You know, <laughs> and that's when you realize you're not working with very good people. Right. <laughs> if, if you like the, if, you like, if you're working on a song and it sounds better as an instrumental than when the singer goes on, you know, you've got to, well, I don't know. I, I, uh, but so, so I wanted to always make sure there was a vocal on there so that you got used to it so you could mold the music around the vocal. Now, not everyone does it that way, and I'm not saying that's the way it should be done, but, but that's the way that I realized that... Um, that so so, so it, it goes back to my point right back in part one where I said, you know, one of my biggest production decisions ever is to... Um, is to do it in the first place. Because I know that I could never say, as I said to you, I could never say to Axl Rose, come in and listen to that, it sounds great. Nothing against Axl Rose, but it's like chalk on a fucking fingers on a chalkboard for me. And I'm sorry, he paid for a first class fare to LA from New York for me. But um, I should have probably told him before I went for that meeting. But anyway, that was the, that's the, 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 for me, the singer is everything. Has this answered the question about my day? I think well, what, it, what, it, what I'm trying to say is that every day is different and it, and it, and it gauges, look, I don't get Shane McGett, like the Pogues, for instance. I would try and steer the Pogues to, to whatever time we started to get the meat and potatoes of a recording done when they were sober, you know, because... I would never book the Pogues for a gig playing at midnight because they're just going to be drunk. You know, it's like, it's a no brainer, you know, get them early when they're early. These are fantastic. Well, when I was working with, you know, brilliant musicians, but you know, you, you start drinking and you get a bit sloppy. Now there's, there's, the, the, there's good music that can be done in that sort of environment, but sometimes you want to get things, you know, you want to try and get as much done. Now, one last quick thing. I was mixing the first Psychedelic Furs album. This was a six-piece band who were very raucous, very, um, very, you know, they liked a good time. They were just young and testosterone-driven, along with punk rock. It was fantastic. It was, you know, Beautiful Chaos was their catchphrase. And Beautiful Chaos wasn't just the music. It was everything about them. You know, it was great. And, um, but it did make me realize that mixing would be time consuming, put it that way. And, and at that time, I had this rule that, you know, I always wanted the artist there when I was mixing because I didn't want them to not like what the record was, but I could foresee some problems with, with, with this. And, and, I, and I remember, and it's the only time I've ever done this, and please stop me if I've said this before, but the idea, I had this idea that we would start mixing at six o'clock in the morning, right? Mm. So my thing was, okay, guys, we're, this is my time now. We're mixing at six o'clock in the morning. Come if you want, right? Mm. And of course, one member of the band came and it was great. You know, it was in a, it was at rack, you know, rack, do you know yeah. rack? Yeah. Rack stu studio two, the one upstairs, the one where Mickey most used to look down on the musicians. 
you know, and um, so it was a really small control room. And but it worked, you know, by the time. And it was a fantastic feeling of getting up at like five in the morning and going to the studio and getting there when it was still dark. And and by the time 930 came, when the rest of the studio staff started appearing, you know, you were well into a mix. And it was mm. it, it was great. We go home at, at six o'clock in the evening and then come back at five, you know, six o'clock in the morning. So it, um, that's the only time I've ever done that. And that was, you know, so that was something completely different. So a, a general day in the studio is really, I, li I like to, you know, and then you get to that point, which is I've always said about you too, where basically you mix the song before you've recorded it. Mm. <laughs> Literally, you mix it before you've recorded it. So let me ask you two little follow-ups with that. Oh, okay. Keeping the vocal, obviously, as the most important thing all the way through the process, when you're going to do some recording before you get to the vocal, I yes. personally feel it's imperative that the singer sing a scratch vocal with the basic tracks, no mm. matter what you're going to keep. And I'm wondering, do you believe the same thing? And right. not record one pass, even if you're working to pre-recorded tracks, they sing every single take. Unless yeah. they're going to blow um, up their voice. Now, the, 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 the only thing I would say is, is let's, you know, I would get them to go and do it like 10 minutes after if you don't want any bleed. Because if, if he's in with the, the band, it can sometimes, you know, just, you know, and, and, and especially if you're trying to get a good backing track or, or, well, what I've actually ended up doing is I used to put a vocal down with the band and then I would keep the vocal and I would run that to the band afterwards so the band would always have a vocal in their head right to play to as well so the singer didn't have to keep doing it 20 takes while the bass player didn't fuck up you know that sort of thing. right right um uh but yeah yeah it's it's <clears throat> or you get to get the singer to go and do it off. And, and as you know, catching a singer when they think it's not that important yeah. is, the essence, is the essence of yeah. a great performance. Absolutely. So very often <coughs> you're always trying to chase that one vocal. You know, you're, you're going, ah, oh, it's got something, you know. Yeah. So, and another thing is, obviously, if the Stones say we don't want to start till 1 a.m., fine. The Talking Heads say yeah. we want to start at 10 a.m., fine. But um, when you're working with younger bands, do they sometimes yeah. propose a method of working that you, uh, this seeing ahead sort of thing, you realize that's not going to work? And then you mm -hmm. sort of impose your will, or do you always try and do what their idea is? Oh, no, 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 no. Look, I'm not, I'm not the, 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 the teacher in the movie If who keeps saying as they're destroying the school, it's fine, you're all okay. <laughs> no, I am not that okay. person. Okay, all right, good. I, 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 you know, especially when it's young people, I, I lead, you know, I am the lifeguard on the beach. I am the one who is trusted and, um, and they, you know, they, they will listen to me, but, but I will look at them and, and I will talk to them beforehand and I'll gauge what sort of time, you know, even if, if it's down to like, you know, the, the, the bass player lives a good hour and a half away. I'm not going to say be there at 10 in the morning when, you know, and if it's a gigging band, maybe you realize that nothing before two o'clock. Right. You know, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. <laughs> but other people like, like David Byrne, you know, was a sort of not in a Gene Simmons sort of businessman way, but in a sort of slightly, I need to be nice and orderly right. and David Byrne structure. Yeah. you know, have a structure. You know, there's no um, pound of opium involved. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was no pound of opium involved. With them. <clears throat> Although I think the Talking Heads did have their moments, but that was before I worked with them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yes, it's. I, I think what I'm saying, and I think you'll you'll agree with me, that you try and use your common sense. Yes. And 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 you don't divide; you unite. And that is. Uh, I'm not getting political. Yes, I am. I'm getting a little yes. bit loose. You try and unite everyone to, to get the best thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think it is important to, to, even with a young band or whatever, to at least entertain 
whatever it is they think they want to do because sometimes yes. there is a vision or a method or something but then also be able to steer it away like i worked on a record where the the singer like we can't comp it has to be full takes and it's like you realize after the first hour of the first song it's not going to happen amazing singer but they lose their concentration their voice break, yeah. like something you got to come. Yeah. And so to steer them towards what's going to work, you that's steer it. Yeah, yeah. But 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 you never say to an artist, you know, hey, oh, this is rule number one. This may well be rule number one. If a singer ever says to you, I can do it better, let him do it. You know, there's no question. Because that is 90% of your record. Now, you you give him the rope. If he if he if he um hangs himself, you've still got the old take. Yeah, you know. exactly. There's no excuse for it now. Make a playlist and move on. No, exactly, exactly. I mean, there, there, there was a, and I don't know who the producer was, but I think he would, he would, it would, he would say there's only two tracks left for vocals. So you do once, and you do a second one, and he goes, if you say, can I do it again? You go, okay, let's go over the first one. You, can you get it better? And it was like <laughs> tightrope walking. I don't know if that's the truth or not, but it's... Um... Oh, I believe it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a sort of... Yeah, it's, it's harsh, I have to say. Yes. It's, a, it's a harsh thing to say that. No, I would never be that right. bad. I would always have a good sick... But the great thing about nowadays with, with, um, with the box is that, you know, and, and with auto-tune is that you, you can really get a singer. What, what, for me, what used to be like seven or eight takes, and I would go through like, like sewing a vocal together. Yeah. And I was proud of myself, of how I could comp literally a, a, a syllable, yeah. you know, from one vocal to another. And I would sit there and I would do it on my own. I would have the, the multi-track. I would send everyone out of the studio. I'd have the multi-track there, and I would have my six faders and my comp. You know, and I would and I would just go through with the lyrics and just just, you know, comping. And mainly we would comp for pitch, you know, that was, you know, because there was no auto tune. And um, but. Yeah, so that they, look, there's lots of different ways to kill a cat. Exactly. And it's a weird thing that because there aren't actually that many ways to kill a cat other than just like cutting its neck. Well, see, now I always heard the over. expression is there are a million ways to skin a cat, which makes to even skin less sense. Which makes We're gonna even less sense. We're going to see Andrew's cats run out of the room. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think only... Mole's going to have something to say about that yeah. in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> there is actually only one way to skin a cat, and yeah. that's with a nut. It's to take the skin off, basically. So anyway, <laughs> let's, let's move on, off. shall we? <laughs> what else you got, Mark? Mole's just sinking into the couch. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that question was from the Page Turner's band. So there it Thank is. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. All right. And our next question comes from Robert Pabst. And I like this one. Longest and fastest mix ever. Longest and fastest mix ever. No question about it. It was a song called New Year's Day by U2. Um, that song, I'd spent the best part of a day mixing it uh, a few days before. And, and Bono, as in his usual self, was um, was saying, give, Steve, give me, give me half an hour for a set of lyrics, because he was writing his lyrics. So I had half an hour window, and, um, and he was in the green room writing his lyrics, which, you know, of course, didn't turn out to be the right lyrics. But anyway, he said, give me half an hour. And, and so I had half an hour in the studio. And I thought, what shall I do? And I went, I, think I want to have another go on New Year's Day because I didn't like the mix I'd done. There was something about it. Now, in those days, your brain had to be so sharp on mixing because there was no uh, computer or anything. So I, it, was, it was almost like I gigged that song in. You know, I, I knew exactly where everything was. I, everything that I, I just wanted to change a few things. And so I said to the engineer, okay, put New Year's Day up put the tape on and we literally from flat faders, the first run through was to roughly get a balance and do us some EQs. The second run through was to get the vocal in and I printed the third take. So I, I played the multi-track. Now, 
the end of New Year's Day goes on for another three minutes. They kept jamming at the end. Well, not you two don't jam. Mm. They kept playing it at the end because the click track just kept going on. So it went on longer. Right. Um, so, but literally, take three was was the take because I, Bono was going, I've got the lyrics. I want, you know, I said, okay, let me. So I took it and uh, and printed it. And that was, yeah, that was a fifth. I always say that was 15 minute mix. And um, it was, it was, it was two run throughs and then print. But, you know, I had really, you know, I I knew my performance. I knew what I wanted. I'd done, it's a bit like, it's a bit like painting a room. You know, it's not the painting. It's like all the little things you do before where you just fill in the holes and you, and you, and you prep it. Once you prepped it, Shum, 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 shum. Thank you. There you go. Straight mm-hmm. to number one. <laughs> <laughs> That's All crazy. Right. So your longest and so your longest are both one song. Oh, the longest yeah. mix. Okay, that was the shortest mix. Probably the longest. Okay. I think I spent a month on who's going to ride your fucking wild horses. I always put the fucking in there because I can't. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Don't say that. I won't say that. Who's going to ride your wild horses? A song by you two that that I really, I really didn't. Um, I don't think it's particular. I, it's the only you two song I ever hear. If I ever hear it, I start twitching because it reminds <laughs> me of basically working on that song back to you know from pretty much re. Oh, it's just. I always with that song. I always and I've said this before. Again, I apologize. It's the, the, the idea of a palette with all the colors all brightly there. You know, a palette of paint, yeah. right? If you have a palette of paint, every color is beautiful. And what Who's Gonna Ride Your Wild Horses is, is you basically get all the colors and you mix them all up <laughs> and, it's and you brown. just get a sludgy brown. <laughs> yes, I've said this. And, uh, <laughs> and it's just brown. <laughs> just like that. Uh, Squid. <laughs> yes, that's... So I don't, it's <laughs> not my, you know, I, I don't think I, I didn't do a very good job on it. Um, I think it turned out quite well, though. I enjoyed yeah. that song. No, 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 you don't. No, no you I, don't. I do, yes. actually. I love that oh, song. There's a great Jimmy <laughs> Iving story. But the, the whole reason we spent so long on that is that this was the follow-up to the Joshua Tree. And, um, and you know, Actung Baby was a, was a different... Hey guys, what's what's your next rocking album? You know, where the streets have a name. You know, <laughs> let's do it. Oh, Actung Baby. Okay. And and you know, where is the where's the fly? Where, where, where's where's the rock? There was no rock songs on that album. The only possible rock song was Who's Gonna Ride Ride You Wild Horses? And um and and, and Bono tells a great story of 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 having a meeting with Jimmy, Jimmy Iovine. Um, and they were, uh, they were talking about house music. And in the background, they were playing rough mixes from Actung Baby. And because uh, house music was starting to become the big thing. And, and Jimmy goes, I'll tell you what house music is, guys. That song there, that's house music. You can buy a new fucking house with that song. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like, yes. You know, it had the blessing of Jimmy Iovine. Right. It needed to be made into the rock. That had to be the rock song on that album, but it it was not really. It, it, it failed for that reason, you know, because they had nothing really to go to radio with. Right. You know, I mean, um, yeah, because one, everyone loved one, but that wasn't the first single, you know, and... Uh, Which one was? Was it even better? I think it was... Even better than the real thing, maybe, or the fly. I don't know. It may well have been the fly because, for some reason, I remember mastering that about fifty times, <laughs> and then remixing it when the. Oh God, that's so funny. I mean, just the sto- Oh dear, I need to put that in my book. Actually, I've forgotten about that. <laughs> make a note. Okay, carry on. Make a note. All yeah, right. make a note now. <laughs> Next one. Oh yes, yes. Who's gonna ride your wild horses by you two? And New Year's Day by you two. Wow, awesome. Shortest and longest. Andrew, how about you? Oh, yeah. Shortest 
is probably it's hard to know but it's probably a song off the last my brightest diamond record because i mm. the way i mix now i mix the whole album at once so i just open up a song and then i stop as soon as i kind of get sick of working on that song and move on to the next one and the first song on that record i mixed the first time i opened the session and i never changed anything ever so mm. i'm assuming it was like an hour hour and a half but i have no idea and mm. longest i don't think longest counts because uh, it could be there was stuff on the international noise conspiracy record i mis mixed where i was just waiting for three or four days mm. and that's not not even waiting for the band so like you could say yes that mix <laughs> took me a week but it didn't take me a week it took other people a week so to find their inspiration yeah probably yes. i would say the ones that i spent the longest on have to be probably one of the sabbath tracks because it was just so long and had so many sections even more than the metallica stuff it, it was like chasing itself to try and be mm. consistent but have it all work and scene changes and that was an analog mix so it was yeah. difficult although sometimes some of these songs that are so complicated sort of mix themselves because there really is only one way they can be you know it's not like you you there's not lots of options because there is only one way the jigsaw can actually fit together because it's such a complicated jigsaw. Yeah. Mm. You know, arguably. I'm just yeah. Saying. Yeah. I think, yeah, sometimes, sometimes it is absolutely like that. Like I've mixed some very long stuff lately for this band motorcycle. It's one of my favorite bands Ooh. and in like a 40 minute song. And it, wow. it really did fall together. It was really terrible. And then all of a sudden it was almost done. Yeah, yeah. But the, yeah, and other stuff, it's, I think it goes back to things you've said many, many times. It's how intentional was all of the recording? Were they just capturing some stuff or were they right. building the song as they went? And if you don't right. build as you go with something that's eight or 10 minutes long and ha goes through lots of scene changes, then you have yeah. to manufacture it. Well, exactly. But, you know, that's how we all started. You know, I mean, when you think about, you know, blah, 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 Sergeant Pepper's blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it's true, you know, you know, mixing the, 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 the bass and drums on one track before you've even done anything else. That's got balls. Yeah. You know, you know, and that was really that, you know, hats off to fucking those guys, you know, just now there was less, uh, far less choice. That's one thing that that, that that youngsters may not understand, that, that even in, in my early days and, and yours as well, is that, you know, there wasn't as much choice as we have now. We have a choice for everything. Yeah. You know, whereas then, you know, you, you, there was not much choice. No. A lot less choice. I, so I've got a question, which I want to ask, which is sort of kind of related to this. It's something I've been thinking about quite a bit in terms of what recording was like back in the day. Yes. I used to use VSO all the time for every single percussion overdub would be done at some other speed. Guitar parts would be done at some other speed to get the timbre up. And like, it was a big part of my like yeah. production process and yes. you can't really do it now because even with the Pro Tools, if you've got the HDX system, you can only go up about a whole step. Do you miss right. that in your production? That is the only thing. That's the only thing that I would say analog has on digital is the ability to, you know, you're double tracking, double tracking an acoustic guitar. Oh, minus, minus, minus 0.1 or, or what, whatever the, yeah. the, the calibration is, you know, and you do that. Now I'm fucking bummed that I've never ever done percussion at different speeds other than to try and make, say a drum more, deep right by speaking it up to have more bottom end in it um and that does that work you can't even do that with digital now can you well does the like bottom i say with, say, with does it change with hdx cards yeah yeah yeah. i mean it does the same vso oh. sort of thing if you can do it with the digital clock speed the system up and then slow it back down it does work but you just don't you, you have do the range. Get more bottom in, you get more bass in a bass drum yeah because it does drop it i we did it, it actually on a record thing. i tracked um last year i can't remember years or they mean nothing anymore but anyway recently <laughs> we did that on right. one song where we actually took it up about a whole step 
track the drums right. and it was Jeremy Stacy and he tuned this kit very big anyway. And when we dropped right. it down, it was ridiculous. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Oh, a, a direct to... Yeah, yeah, straight to Pro Tools. But the problem is straight, you can't right. go up as far as a tape machine could. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. No, that that's... I, I, I used to... Yeah, I, I don't think I've ever done that in... It's weird because it, with digital now, you just go, well, we'll just put a chorus on it or just... Yeah, you know. but it's a very different thing. It is a different thing, you know. But so, we live in different worlds. Yeah, we do. We, but I, I, know, I've, lately, was, I've been missing it enough that I want to pressure somebody to figure it out. Because well, buy, buy yourself a Studer A twenty four or something. I've just sold a Studer A eight hundred. So A eight hundred, right? Yeah, yeah. whatever. I'm not yeah. gonna. Yeah, no, I'm well, not. The question is, who bought it from you? Um, a private buyer. It's a all of my gear, no, no, no. <laughs> All of my stuff went to one person. So, oh, right. And the tape machine was part of the all of my stuff things. So. Right, right, right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, I have no desire to work on tape anymore. I don't want the noise of it. I don't want the alignment of it. I don't, you know, I yeah. absolutely yeah, 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 yeah. don't want to work on tape, but I miss VSOing. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Absolutely. No, I, I'm, I'm with you 100%. That's the only thing. And I think I've, I've probably come to that conclusion. Yeah. You know, in the early days when I, when it was, when I was weaning myself off, you know, now yeah. I don't think about it anymore. Well, but you've and just I think I, when I, because I have been thinking about it quite a bit, the thing that made me realize, no, I'm not making this up, is that one of the ways you can actually VSO a digital system now is by an ADAT, because if you leave it sitting, you can actually v use its very speed and it will spit out a very sped clock. Oh, but it's a digital now, tape. So consumer grade digital tape machines could VSO because it was that important. It would have been right. so much easier to not allow that thing to VSO. <laughs> but it had to. <laughs> you couldn't you I could not sell a recording device that didn't VSO. Right, right, right. But ADAT, what a horribly uncreative piece of hardware. Yeah. So uncreative. I I don't think I ever made a record on ADAT. I virtually never made a record with slave with with I used to hate slaves. I well, mean, because okay. I would always let me ask you another question then. Yeah. This is I have a very short list of questions, but one of the questions I had at the very beginning of Games Without Frontiers, you've got a tape yes. machine coming up to speed. Yeah. So was that a slave or that was the multi-track coming up to speed, but the half inch was already that was in the multi-track coming up to speed because the drum machine was already going. Actually, the same thing. I was just listening to the first U2 album on I Will Follow at the very beginning. You hear the tape start yeah. because they're already and you press start and goes, you know, it's fantastic. But the idea of a slave, for me, your perspective of everything changes. Every time you overdub something, you have to slightly tweak the mix. And you're, and you're if you've made a slave of the backing track, I, I don't know, I just... And then the whole idea of running two twenty-four tracks at the same time during overdubbing is so was so 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 uncreative yeah, for me. No, because you couldn't do that. You couldn't do that because the fucking guy's in there with his headphones. You, you know, it's horrible. Yeah, it was, that was very technical. That did you hear that? Yeah, <laughs> but that's exactly what it was like. And you would be just like, "Please lock before I have to punch." Please lock yes, before I have yes, to punch. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> stressed oh. out. <laughs> yeah. Well, that yeah. was you know, uh, uh, Daniel Lanois did say to me, and and um, and it was great. You know, great piece of advice. If you can't do it on a twenty-four track, there's something wrong with your recording. You know, and that's just a very simple, you know, he said that in 1986 when, yeah. when you know, 87. Wow. Yep. All right, yeah, there you go. Did. So we've knocked off most of my list. So let's go back to, to the other people's list. <laughs> this okay. is going to take all night, isn't it? It, it can. <laughs> it's up to you. Oh, God, sorry about the question. Look, let me or apologize. It's going to be a part 10. <laughs> okay. One okay. word answers. One word answers. Okay, there's going to be a... It's going to be a five-word answer to this next question. Okay. Okay. Oh, you can do five words. You might not need as many. Um, okay. So this is a little bit of a continuation of what we were just talking about a question ago. But uh, Mark Allen asks, out of all your work with you 2 what is a song that you loved and the band didn't? And conversely, what is a song that the, bad, the band was adamant about but you didn't care for? 
that part you kind of got. Oh, um, uh, the, the, I remember very early on, there was the band had, not that I really liked it, but the band didn't like it. And it was, and it was considered a, because it was like commercial. And I was like trying to find a hit record for them. They, and it was called Pete the Chop, Pete the Chop. And uh, we tried recording Pete the Chop a few times. I thought it was okay. It was, was catchy. They hated it because it was, but then we sort of bastardized the song and it became whatever happened to Pete the Chop. And that was a B-side. So um, uh, uh, really? YouTube fans will know whatever happened to Pete the Chop. Yeah. The reason is, is because Pete the Chop was considered too commercial to be, um, no, it wasn't commercial, it was just crap really. But, <laughs> but you know, it was, it was too poppy, you know. Um, that was the one that, you know, just, uh, but let me think. No, the, 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 the band don't dislike much of their music. I mean, they, by the time, so you two start millions of songs and finish enough for an album, mm. you know? So there's not much, I mean, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of stuff that is various different times of certain songs with maybe a different melody or a different guitar part, but, but at the end of the day, it's, they don't, they don't finish a song and then discard it. If it's discarded, it's not finished. If it's finished, it's, re it's released. <laughs> right. Nice. You know, pretty much that's almost five words. Yeah. Yeah. And as the next question is coming, I'm going to sneak over here and put the kettle back on. Oh my. And top up my, I tell you what, this, this looks like just like boring old twinings, green tea and mint. But it's actually it's opium, isn't it? It's, yeah, green tea, <laughs> twinings, green tea and mint. I recommend it, folks. See, I just got paid for that sponsorship. Nice. I, had to, I, had to, I forgot to tell you, right? I'm, I'm sponsored by twinings, green tea and mint. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, what else you got, Mark? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, come on, uh, come on. I can, I can multitask here. Okay. Uh, well, I'm sure that you have many memories of this, but Ryan Green asks, "Do you have any memories of recording Dave Matthews Band back in Woodstock in 1994 for Under the Table and Dreaming?" I heard Dave mention on Sirius XM that he recalls the band had so much energy since it was their first record deal, and Steve was able to capture that magic. Yes, um, it was. You know. The band basically had uh, the recording studio booked and they were looking for a producer and they decided to work with Jerry Harrison. And by the, and I, but by the time their, 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 their self released um, LP had got to me, which was their version of a demo tape. I was living in London and, and when I heard it, I went, I suddenly had this epiphany and I thought, I need to go and see this band. I need to produce this band. Get me on a flight to New York. Uh, and I went to New York and they had the studio booked. I went to see them at Irving Plaza. Uh, Jerry Harrison, who I had produced in the Talking Heads, was there. Hello, Jerry. Hi, Steve. I hear you're going to do the album. I said, he goes, yeah, I think so. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm going to do this. <laughs> he was fine. You know, it's, uh, it's all fair in love. Of, you know, there's enough bands to go around to everyone. And to be honest, they were not really, you know, it wasn't, it, you know, I've, I've said before, Hugh Padgham turned them down because he thought the drummer was too jazzy, you know. And, uh, and it was, you know, a lot of people that, you know, they, they got signed to RCA. You don't sign to RCA if many, many, many people want to sign you. I don't think. I don't know. Not in those days. Not no, not not for that genre back then. No, no, that genre was not was not really considered. It was, you know, but I saw it. I saw it, and I and I and I and I got it right from the word go, and uh, so I was really press ganged them into into saying I want to do this album. But the album was, but the but the. Um, maybe why my passion with that band was, was so pure, you know, a lot of producers have tried to change them. And, and I think what I managed, what I, my thing was, was I got them. 
I completely understood um, the, the 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 combination of of songs and 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 solos because I don't they're not a jam band. I never think of them as a jam band because. They, it was just soloing, you know. It's not like Fish are a jam band because they go up and down all together. What what Dave Matthews about? It was, I mean, maybe semantics. I don't know, but I, I I saw them as a different sort of band. I saw them as these great songs, you know. And Dave as a songwriter in those those early three albums, you know, he was just uh, spectacular. You know, they they are just you know Jimmy thing. There's some great great songs in. Are you a Dave Matthews fan, Mark? I am. Yeah. Oh, wow. the early stuff. I like the first two records. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, good, good, good. Well, you know, you, 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 you get those songs, right? The songs are great. So, I mean, because they're unusual, they're catchy. You know, they're they're, 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 they're intelligent. The the musicianship. I mean, maybe Dave was never Bob Dylan lyric wise, but but they were mysterious lyrics, and that's good. It, it wasn't Moon in June, you know. Um, so so Woodstock was booked. And I, I went in there. One of my absolute rules was that w- with them, and I, I, I realized that I, I remember having a meeting with them before we went in the studio, and they said, "I said, well, you've got only acoustic guitar, bass, and drums, really, with you, with these violin and saxophone." I said, "We need to," uh, and th- they said, "We have this other guitar player called Tim Reynolds, who will be coming in to do overdubs." And I said, hmm, can we have him there right from the very beginning? Why? They said, because I want him to play acoustic guitar with Dave. Because I wanted double tracked acoustics, but I didn't want the same person to do it. Because when the same person double tracks acoustics left and right, if there's a like a, it's a bit out of time or something, it, it doesn't sound good. If there are two people playing acoustics intermingling they have different styles so therefore you get you get performance and that's what i really wanted the two the two acoustics left and right and 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 that was never something they had ever thought of you know and and even down to the point you know i think on the sleeve it says dave dave matthews left guitar tim reynolds right you know i mean literally Mm -hmm. that was our basis was the two and I had them in a room together and they were hilarious. And it really put Dave at ease, you know, and, um, and it was just a beautiful time. It was in the summer in Woodstock, uh, in, in Bearsville. It was, you know, great studio that was well, well, um, maintained, well man- maintained, right. With, 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 you know, some, some great tech, you know, the wonderful Mark McKenna, who's the... Uh, did you ever work up in, Wood- in no, Bearsville? No, never did. Oh, you didn't. Well, you look like you should have done, Andrew Shepard. <laughs> well, that's all. That <laughs> you look like the man from Bearsville. <laughs> no, it was great. You know, and, and you would go to the restaurant, and you see Donald Fagin, who lived up there. You know, and, and, and it was just a wonderful uh, hippie community where big corporations were not allowed to have a shop in the street even ben and jerry's were 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 run out of town because it would you know and and you don't get more hippie than ben and jerry's but no the local ice cream store had to have that franchise because big corporations and that is you know i'm i'm against big corporations and and you know people say oh government is so corrupt but it's not for me you know you can vote out of government but Big corporations, I think they get too big and they and they basically run. Now, you can say, well, if government didn't take those bribes, now we're getting political again. So I'll exactly. just stop. Yeah. Because There's we an Amazon with- drone outside of your window right now. Yeah. <laughs> <Here and find. laughs> and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I know. It's That's the dichotomy, isn't it? You know, you can't stop. Yeah, but anyway. No, exactly. Exactly. You okay. can't stop... Um, uh, uh, so Dave Matthews, yes. So it was just a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, uh, I, I loved putting, um, <laughs> I loved putting the band through their paces, you know, um, and and building up because they'd never done, you know, people like Leroy, the the sax player, who's sadly no no longer with us, and Boyd, the violin player. 
they no one had ever sat down with them in the studio and they were jazzers they would do their part and that was their part i opened up to them the idea of stacking and working on on um multi-tracking and and stuff you know because i didn't want to use any electric guitars i thought i have to what's unique about this band when they play live is it's an acoustic guitar that's what it is there's no electric and it works live my job is to make that work in a studio you know that and that was the soul of what it was i didn't want to change the soul i wanted to change the peripheries the the fairy dust the 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 the, the decoration around it you know but the actual meaning of what that band was had to stay intact and and by doing it that way i think i i i was true to the true to what they wanted great awesome there you go that's that question there, there you go Okay. All right. Next question. Rapid fire. Uh, this one comes from Ben and he says, hi, could Steve tell us about the recording for the drums on Sunday, bloody Sunday, if it's possible to hear about how the drum part was created, uh, the use of a click versus no click and the snare drum sound. Sounds Larry like is an underrated drummer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sounds like he's already heard me tell this story because yes, that's <laughs> what it was. I'd recorded the first two U2 albums without a click. And between the second and the third, I had started my love-hate relationship with a click track. And I still have that love-hate relationship. I, 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 you know, I've said many times that, you know, a, a, a producer with balls would, would record a band without a click. You know, some of your favorite records were done without click tracks. But anyway... I remember uh, Sunday, Bloody Sunday. Now, now Larry was in marching band at, at school. Um, so, so really, the, he just took the drum part from one of his marching band things. But I, 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 abs I, but I remember, as, as this is one of those really clear memories I've got, saying, because Sunday, Bloody Sunday was the first song on that album. And I said, look, Larry, I've been using this thing called a click track. Will you, um, will you, dive will you go on this journey with me you know and he went yeah sure you know he was open to it i said okay what you've got you've got this thing in your head tick, tick, tick. and um and you play your part and basically if you can hear the click you're out of time because every time the click hits is where one of your snare comes so if you can and the snare should be louder in because it's a fucking loud thing should be louder than uh than the click i mean the click's loud but you should it you know yeah. you shouldn't hear it you, you sh so i would i literally start and you know you don't record it straight away I, this was just a rehearsal so i'd run the click and he'd start playing and of course being a uh, a young uh, probably 19 year old drummer even though it was their third album, I think he was only 19. He was just, you know, because drummers, and unless they, you know, I think young drummers are like that. You know, drummers, when they get older, become like, you know, they become like, it's the difference between a, a kitten, as, and, as, and you will know that a kitten's always running around, running around, running. An older cat just sits there, right? And this is the difference between a young drummer and an old drummer. And so he was just like, I would always say, lapping the click, literally lapping the click <laughs> by, 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 you know, 10 seconds. It would take him 10 seconds to actually chase it to the, to the, to the beat in front, you know. And, uh, and I would say, come on, Larry, slow down, calm down, get that groove. And I hate saying that's the thing is that using a click, everything has to be a groove. And it's a pity because the groove that you're getting with a click is a sort of preordained groove. It's not a groove that comes from the spirit of that person uh, in, a, in a way, in a way. Anyway, so but anyway, I got him to do the click because in those days, you know, it was the new thing. And I wanted, you know, I'd hear records, you know, because it was when records with drum machines were really kicking off and drum machines. It was very easy to press a button. But of course, I was making records with real drummers, but I wanted my records to have the, the, um, comp, the, 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 the tightness of the drum machine records. 
because I, you know, I, I wanted my records to be up against every record. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, times in my career, I've managed to do that. Um, so I, I, you know, spent a whole day with him and eventually got him, but you know, it would take just, uh, hours of dropping in, you know, punching in and sometimes punching in, in those days on a, uh, on a 24 track with, with a drum kit, you would just, you know, you would get symbols would suddenly cut out and you know, it was just a, it was really, really complicated down to the fact that I'll just quickly with big country. I remember it was so, um, it was so bad that, that they had a three M tape machine. It was so difficult to, to punch out on a drum kit that I actually had to, and I wanted to redo the drums for the first 20, for, for one section of the song, but I couldn't punch out and I didn't want, you know, so what I'd had to do is I had to cut the multi-track, put some leader in yeah, and then redo the drums and then join the tape back together again. Yeah. So that, the wow. you know, although Andrew Sheps, you must tell me this story because the legend goes that Metallica cut out little windows in the 24 track. And I well, always thought that's impossible. Well, okay, I've got I've got a couple stories that go along with that. I don't know about Metallica doing window edits. I don't know about that, but I do know that on the I believe on the Black Album, they had mm -hmm. notebooks full of pieces of two inch tape that were drum fills or things. So they would literally cut the piece of tape put it in a notebook with a piece of paper describing what it was so that they could then edit it back together. And, but the window edit thing, so the cutting the tape and putting in leader when it, you had a tight punch out, I assisted yeah. Fred Gattaro, who was a great engineer in the Bay Area, he did all the early Chicago records and, oh, and I assisted him one of my first gigs ever. And right. his right. eyesight was not great. So he made me do all of the editing and I knew nothing at this point, but that's the way he recorded vocals. He never would trust the punch out. And so we, we would cut the tape. So we must have cut the tape 30, 40, 50 times while doing vocal tapes wow. on a song. So you cut it, pop the leader in, do the punch, cut the leader back out, put it back together, listen, oh, no, no good. Put the leader back in. Amazing. <laughs> but, oh my gosh. <laughs> but during the session, there was, I believe it was a bass punch where there was a little double attack. Right, yep. This was in 1986, and it was, I believe it was an Otari machine, so it had spot erase. And right, yes. when I was young and couldn't get into the studio to actually do anything, I would sit around and read manuals. So I knew how to do spot erase, and I'd even practiced right. it. Ooh. And Fred's like, no, I don't trust that. We're not doing that. We can't, we can't go into record when the transport's not running. You'll, it'll erase everything. Like, we're not doing that. <laughs> and he pulled out of his back pocket a cardboard template that fit over the edit block that showed you where the individual tracks were. And Ooh. I had to do a window edit. Mm. And I had to well, cut you... out this bit. Fortunately, we did it, cut it, and then immediately safety the tape. Because the problem is... If you don't get the corners exactly square, mm -hmm. the tape flies apart the next time you rewind it as it goes past. Yeah. And okay, I, that, that's, that's the closest I ever came to crapping my pants in a session was having to do a window edit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but that's the only no, time I, I've ever I'm even heard of it things. actually physically happening. Yeah. There, it's I, an I, 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 I never knew whether window editing was just an urban myth. No, it, I mean, in, but even Fred said he didn't, like, this was a last resort. Right, 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 right. Damn, because I I, I never heard that bass double thing either. Does it really? <laughs> yeah, you know, nowadays. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the stuff that's so easy to fix, you never even think about it now. Yeah, was like, yeah, man, yeah, that yeah. punch out, oh, do we redo it from a bar oh. earlier? What do we, you know? Because that's what you'd have to do. If and the punches course, didn't work, you'd keep backing up and backing up and backing up. And and then all of a sudden, yeah. you're not... Your, your session has gone off on another thing. Exactly. And, and, you know, you have to really... This is why you have to be master of your equipment. You know, because if, you're, if, the, if you let the equipment be master of you, so many... It can go off. That's, you know, that's why I... 
you know, if I don't know my mixing desk, if I, as I said, the, you know, I think the SSL J series is probably a fantastic mixing desk. I just look at it and shit my pants because it's just like, it's too proper. It's too like big, you know, give me an, give me an API, just simple clicks, click, click. No, I don't know. I digress. Next question. <laughs> Next question. All right. All right. Uh, do you guys want to do a plug-in question or a big country no. question? All right. I don't knock too much. Tain. Well, what's the plug-in question? And I'll go pass. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't want to be arrogant, but. Uh, this one's from Stefan. If you had to mix with five plugins only, which one would you use? Which I one? Or one? He'd no, use my channel strip because he loves me. That's I it. do. I do. And I, 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 I've got one apparently, <laughs> but I don't. I just got someone to do it for me. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oops. oops. <laughs> I, I would always use the Andrew Sheps. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I, no, it's not. That's not my world, really. I mean, mm -hmm. I, must, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm not Luddite, but I, 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 I know that, that you have to do all this stuff, but it just, I mean, yeah. Anyway, carry on. Still, uh, do you still work all analog? No, I haven't worked in analog yeah. for years. I, I, I'm but with Andrew. consoles and mixing. And, yeah. No, I, I've, I've got my own little setup here, but I haven't turned it on for, year, for a year. Mm -hmm. um, last thing I did was, a, was a, I, I mixed U2, first single off their last album I did here. Um, you're the best thing that ever happened to me. But other than that, um, and, and I've just got a, a, a controller. Because for mm -hmm. me, I've got 10 fingers and I can balance with 10 fingers. Balancing on a map, because I'm not the guy who sits with the mouse. I've never been that guy. I used to be, when I was a, uh, I used to be a producer tape op. I used to be the tape op and the producer, but not the engineer. Um, and I've always, every single record I've ever made, I've sat next to the engineer with faders there. You know, before automation, I would, you know, I would be doing half the half the mixing, you know, because you needed 20 fingers in those days. Now with the, with the mouse, I, I can, you know, I, I will do some balancing, but then I have to go and sit at the back and let my, you know, a lot more passive now. You know, I let, you know, but, but I'm 65 years old. I, 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 and I don't mean that like I hated people who always used to talk about their age. But the fact is, I don't. You know, my time has sort of passed and I think I'm more and I've and I've slightly changed how I like to work and how, I, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm pretty much retired. I'm not sure if and it sort of just came about. I don't know if I ever I, I never said I'm going to retire, but all of a sudden I've suddenly thought. I think I've retired. <laughs> I think I've sort of pretty much. Well, but, stopped. you know, doing the you two single that's not retired yeah so yeah that was, <laughs> yeah but that was you know, that <laughs> two or three years ago and i and, and i do occasional things in indonesia with my friends and stuff like that but but no i i, I yeah let's see what happens yeah but i'm much more interested in my stand-up in my telling stories in you know and things like that i i you know just that. And it's it's no fault of the technology. It's just the way the way creative people think now is very different to the way the way creative people used to think. Mm -hmm. And the main difference is that in the old days, people creative people would try and steer away from sounding like anyone else. And now people just go fantastic, change a chord because we know there's a there's a template for a hit record because we're, we're looking at the past. I think and part of that is because of technology, because technology will always lead you to more things in the future, but the technology hasn't changed in about 10 years now. So, so music has sort of got, not stagnant, but there's not much new sonically that will drive the art form. And, um, you know, plugins are plugins, and you know maybe sound has got has has reached a point where sound will always be, and um, 
but that's sort of much more big philosoph philosophical. Yeah, but, but if yeah. I was, I think if I was younger, maybe I would, I would, I would say, Steve, you're fucking stupid. Now is the best time ever for sound, and maybe they're right, you know. But I don't feel as excited about sound now that than I did, you know. Well, and as you can tell, I'm 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 a people person. I like to. I like to 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 to, to mould things yeah. with a team with a team of people. Now, when you look at the, the 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 very successful production teams around now, the sort of Max Martins, they all have it's all a team of people. It might say Max Martin, but they, you know, and th there is you know he employs a you know all these young people, yeah. and and I never sort of did that. I never. I never transferred my creative talents to that sort of a world. And, you know, maybe I missed out. But no, I think, I think at the moment, the, um, the sort of sonic experimentation and pushing the boundaries and things is all happening in genres, which is not people... Um, oh, hold on a second. People are calling me. Um, which are I genres which are not famous, done with people in a room. Like right. hip hop pushing the boundaries like crazy. Some pop stuff like the Billie Eilish record, some of those production yeah. ideas, but none of those are based upon live band records. No, no, and that, and that's you know that that it's still bedroom recording, you know, and it's great. That's fantastic. But I come from a recording studio culture. Yeah. I don't come from a sit at home on your own in a bedroom creating yeah, uh, yeah but that's what i'm saying is like that's where the innovation is it's a totally yeah 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 yeah, yeah. it is and and you know yeah look i i i i absolutely um admire people however they create their art because you know passion is the most important thing if you're passionate about it it's great yeah and uh, if you lose your passion you should you know this goes to my theory from the other day like you know I think Paul McCartney and Elton John have made too many records. Where is their passion for it? And, uh, and you know, there you go. And there you passion have it. Everything. Well, there you have it. Uh, speaking of Billie Eilish, this next question comes from Phineas with a PH <laughs> <laughs> um, in the chat room. Uh, and he asks, are your productions like your children where you can't rank them or you can say, yes, there's one record which I'm most proud of? Oh, abs look, even with my children, I have my favorites. Oh, my <laughs> God. Of course I do. They won't uh, I would never tell them. I always <laughs> play them off each other. I have four children. And I always say to them, look, you, you're my number two or number three. Be nicer to me, and I might be able to move you. <laughs> yeah, so your up. your family life is like Succession. That that show. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Yeah. No, no. Of course, you know you you love all your children for, for obviously different reasons. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to be rude and text the person who called me to let him know that I will call him later. I so, bet that's someone really famous, isn't it? It, it isn't, but it, it's somebody who uh, we're making a record. And so I just want to let him really? know that I'm going to call someone him. Someone in the chat room said to tell Bruce Springsteen to stop calling you. Yeah, well, <laughs> Bruce is not calling me. He's not calling me. No. God, isn't it terrible to think I have not even listened to the new Bruce Springsteen album? I can and say that about the last 15 Bruce Springsteen albums. Yeah, but, but he made it with the E Street Band, and I always think he's best when he's with the E Street Band because it's a band of, of raggle, raggle, taggle, ragamuffins, and it's, you know, sort of great. But no, I didn't listen to it. Well, there note, you go. Note to self. <laughs> Lift up new Bruce Springsteen. So the question was, Mark Abrams, what was the which question? one of your children production? is your favorite? Oh, which one of my <laughs> albums do I like? Well, I, always, I like to say that that you know, if you can, if you can um, inspire someone to write a song through the sound that you've got them and the and the idea that you've that you put in the studio that has to be something amazing and and with big country back in the day and I, I know in america big country were considered a little bit poppy because mtv video of them on four by fours looking a bit like the monkeys the song sound the song with the same name as the band yeah. not good for longevity of career 
But in the UK, big country were, were a rock band. And before in a big country was a song called Fields of Fire which um, was another, you know, rousing Scottish type thing. And, and of course, Stuart Adamson, the, the, the main guy in the band, had been in a band called The Skids, who were fantastic. Um, so anyway, I'd, I'd, I'd recorded, I went and did one single with them and um, with the idea of maybe doing the album. And, and, and I did the one single and all of a sudden, from the, 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 and I did it Rack Studio One, used the room, got this really good, lively sound. I, I just, it turned out really, really well. And, and, and the singer, who's sadly no longer with us, he, he went away and he was so like amazed by what he'd heard. He wrote in a big country. And I think to be able to inspire someone through what you've, done for him to write a song to the sound that you that you had sort of given them is uh is humbling and really really satisfying so the big country album i loved um i really am proud of the album i did with a band called guster g-u-s-t-e-r called lost and gone forever because this was also a band who were basically two acoustic guitars and bongos and Everyone on their albums before and maybe afterwards said, well, you can't have that. You've got to have real drums. If you want to have a record, if you want to have a good record, you need to have real drums. And I looked and I saw them again. I saw them live and I went, this is fucking brilliant. It absolutely works with two. I mean, the bongos were so powerful that it's like, if they can make them that powerful live, I can do the same thing. There's got to be a way. And this was my challenge to make it sound. So, you know, there's no drum kit on Lost and Gone Forever. It's just the bongos. But boy, did I, did we stretch the creative part of that album. And, um, and you know, uh, that is one of the, the albums. My, my eldest two kids, absolute, that was part of their youth. And they, abs they know every single part, including the typewriter, bits in the middle of one song and it you know and i think probably you know tr true gusta fan you know gusta fans will say it's their best album and mm. uh it you know so I, I was very proud of that one you know i'm proud of what i did with you two over the years proud of what i did with dave matthews band obviously because you know it was a great journey you know to go on a journey and to and to steer a band especially with Dave Matthews Band, because they were just musicians. So I would steer the sound of the albums. And it was an art, it's definitely an art form of, you know, making sure the length is not too long for an album, but not so short that they become pop songs because they are not a pop band. You know, so you needed to get, you know, a lot of editing, a lot of shortening and, 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 and making sure the solo, you see, because solos, when they're solos, are there and gone solos when they're on an album become a part so you have to really make sure that the parts are just fantastic you know and um and for me you know the the greatest solos are ones that are melody uh, that you can whistle you, you can know I mean, you know it's it's not just meanderings it's 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 something that every single note is perfect you know is is there for a reason so a lot of comping, a lot of, a lot of, um, you know, just molding. And then when we moved to the next album with Dave, okay, we did this on the last album. Let's do something different. Mm -hmm. Like only acoustic guitars on, 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 uh, under the table and dreaming just acoustic guitars, mic'd. on, on crash. I wanted to make it more muscular because the band were becoming more, um, they, you know, they were bigger. And they were like more swaggering and, and, you know, so, but I didn't want to use electric guitars because I still thought there was more, more room in that world. So I electrified, you know, we amped up the acoustic guitars to give them more, but they were still just acoustic guitars, no fuzz, no nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, yeah. And then of course, on, on, on the third album, uh, before the Scratch Streets, we did bring in lots of other musicians. So they, Every album, you know, and it all goes back to, 
to, to, to my upbringing of the Beatles, where, you know, in a five year journey, they, they had an incredible journey in five years. We tried to do that with you too. You know, they were forever reminding me, us, you know, we can't do that because we did that on the last, you know, mm. it's uh, always try and innovate. Try, you know, because it, it keeps you happy as an artist doing different sounding stuff and it takes your fans on this journey you know well, so i always had this idea of a journey with the artist let me ask you a question about the guster record because it's something that comes up when you've got a, i mean and this is sort of the epitome of it where when you see the band live it's ridiculously powerful but then it's like okay this is bongos and you're not going to have the benefit of a PA driving a room when people listen to the record. So you say you stretch things, but I'm curious, like what turned out to be kind of the key element of getting that kind of power out of small speakers? Well, uh, a lot of compression, a lot of ambience, uh, a lot of a lot of changing the perspectives of each bongo. I would we recorded at the, at the plant in Sausalito, which was a very bright um, studio. You know, so you could you could you know you could suck some of the room into the microphones. You know, you could so so I would split his part again. I, I love doing this. You know, taking a drum part and say, okay, what I want to do is to have each drum like you do that now in in the press of a button. You know, a different you have an ambient tom to, because it's all on the in the box. But to do this with a real drummer. You know, so I would I would take the, um, you know, like some drum hits I would do with a lot of compression, a lot of ambience. Other ones I would have really, you know, I would do it in a really dead room with the curtains closed. But that would be a small sound I would do like that. So so the loud sound would be loud and distant. The small sound would be this little tinkly, this little thing in your ear that was nudging away at you. So you... You know, so the power that you got live through a PA, I was sort of mimicking by by by, by sonic three D ness, right. I suppose. Mm, right. You know, if you understand. Yeah, that. and also not trying to make everything big, letting the contrast make. Oh the big no, no, no! Seem exactly. You, you, yeah. you, because if you, and this is one of the problems that people maybe don't understand is that if everything is big, the end record just sounds small yeah you know you, you know you have the, the the best drum sound the best bass sound. you know it's there's not enough room for the best of everything the reason that that that, that john bonham sounded so good was because they were loud the reason i always thought chrissy hines vocal was so good was that it was in your face close up you know there's 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 re you know it's um yeah it's how each thing is balanced, you know, because the loudest thing in the mix will sound great. And there you have you know, it. Unless, unless you do those sorts of perspective things and, and, you, and you get, you know, but then you don't want it to sound like a fucking rehearsal room. Right. <laughs> so you need some things that are like this. Right. Because if everything is loud and ambient, it just sounds like one mic in the middle of the room. Right, right. Excellent. Awesome. So how's, okay. how's your brain doing here? How's what? How's your brain doing? You up for a few more? I'm talking about myself. I'm fine. Excellent. All right. <laughs> well, okay. let's, let's continue to talk Thanks. about you. Okay. It's, it's four o'clock. Cool. Okay. Uh, Mula so... Mula has started, by the way. The call to prayer. Right. It's in the background? In the background, yes. Uh... Next question. Nice. Okay, so everybody that's watching on Crowdcast, do me a favor and click on ask a question below the video and upload each other's questions because we actually have a ton of questions coming in and it'll help uh, you guys to get the ones that you really want to hear answered, answered. So do that. And then we also have other ones that are coming in from the, the pre form that people could do before. There's still questions coming in on that. It's pretty crazy. Okay, uh, this next one is from Pat. And Pat asks, who is the most annoying fan base that you produced a record for? <laughs> That's annoying. a big one. Oh, yeah. God. I, I, um, I don't Maybe, really you know, know, we could do most particular or something. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know the fans that much. Um, you know, they Dave Mac. Look, the most annoying fan base are the most passionate, and without the most passionate, we are nothing. Because you know, so you know, as annoying as some people may be, they're passionate about it because that's why they're annoying. They care, and that's the most important thing. So bring on the annoying. I love it. Yeah. And tell yeah. me where I'm going wrong. You know, if that's I'm, actually so. On the previous thing with the Dave Massey's, you know, records on record number two, you said like they have more swagger yeah. from a producer's perspective. You've had to deal with this several times where you had a band that you've started out with. And then as they've seen great success, obviously expectations rise with that. So what was like Italy dealing with that with, you know, you two, Dave Matthews? Yeah, you have to deal with that. But, you know, if um, you try and stay humble. Dave is the most humble man, you know, for him, it's not, uh, you know, other members of the band, they change and everything, but, but, but if, if, if Dave is, is, is humble and stays humble, um, then, then it, it, it whatever the others do, it, it doesn't matter so much. It doesn't, you know, they can't get that above themselves. Well, I think, you know, and because, you touched on this with you two before, the, the good thing about having been in early is you establish the relationship and there's always a bit of that left. Yeah. So you two oh, still I've, see yeah. you as you're the dad coming in. I'm, I'm still five years older than the eldest member of the band. Yeah. Which, you know, when you're 25 and 20. It's a big is difference. A fucking, it's a big difference. Mm -hmm. But when you're yeah. 65 and 60, not so much. But you do you do retain <laughs> that. And it's, it's not, not, I'm not saying it because, oh, you retain this power over them. But what it, what's oh. great about it is you retain the sense of only being there to make a record without the expectation. And that can right. actually oh, carry right. forward, which is exactly. great. Exactly. So, you know, and, you know, when, and even with Dave Matthews, when I went back and did Away From The World, um, X amount of years after I got fired by them, it, it was fine. You know, we, we went in and it was, you know, the bad times were forgiven. We're men. Men don't hold grudges. Men are okay. We look at the big picture. Hang on, is there another sex? Oh, there is another sex and it's called <laughs> women. Sometimes they, they hold grudges. Anyway, let's not go into that. No, no, but, no. Um, no. But, but, you know, it's, it's, you know, men get on with, 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 with men stuff. You know, we don't, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, another question, please. Yes. Okay. Um, this is a fun one. Uh, this is for both of you. Um, and we may have already touched on Steve's part of this uh, a bunch. But um, so Darren Keen asks or says hi to you all. Uh, Andrew, what U2 song or album would you have liked to have mixed? So that's <laughs> Andrew's part. Um, and then uh, Steve's part is uh, what frustrates you the most about U2's working methods? <laughs> From Darren with a huge smile on his face. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you, you go first. Well, see, I never... Well, Listen to I don't want to say never. I almost never hear a record and say, God, I wish I'd mixed that. It's only if I absolutely love it, but feel like it's not, people won't listen to it because it sounds terrible sort of thing. Like, and that does happen, but there is no U2 record that I wish I had mixed. Like, I think that, that some of them, I mean, all U2 records have their own thing and are great. I think Octum Baby from the very first, <laughs> <laughs> that was fucking yeah. mind blown yeah, all the way yeah. through that record yeah. in ways that other U2 records haven't struck me, but it never occurs to me that I want to get my hands on it. Right. That was flood at his most floodness. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Flood is just a legend. Um, and what was the question again? Where are we? <laughs> the, the, oh, Do, what, uh, what, an, what annoys you the most about their working methods? <laughs> well, they were, oh, God. Well, we, um, well we, don't, we don't have to go negative on things, you know. No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. Just very quickly, though, I agree with you. I, I very rarely listen to records that I think I wish I'd made that record. I just mm -hmm. enjoy it. And I never listen, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think, oh, there's mistakes in that record or the, the you know, I, I don't think like that, really. The only one I, I do remember before they made their first album, there was a band called The Strokes, 
who I saw playing at a club and it was one of my favorite ever gigs. It was just powerful, brilliant. And, uh, and I was so excited when their first album came out and I listened to it and I went, Oh my God, that's not like it, it was thin and just, it didn't have the power that I know I, I could have, I would have loved to have produced the first Strokes album. It was just brilliant. Um, but other than that, really, no, I don't, um, I don't. Yeah, so so the most annoying thing about you too, oh, um, there's nothing annoying. You you know, you, you look back and you go, oh, you know, Bono's not being there, you know, and then coming back or, or but that's not really annoying. Um, and it's not, you know, that what is annoying at the time, and in retrospect, you realize that it was right, is that is their complete dedication to trying to make it as good as possible, you know, which can absolutely, I mean, that one of my uh, uh, engineers, Carl Glanville, lovely man, um, he, uh, I got him in you two wanted an engineer but they didn't want a producer at the time and they said steve is there anyone you can recommend we're just doing like we're doing stuff we're you know there's no album on the horizon you know we just wanted someone to come in and record and i said to carl okay oh no it may have been for an album because i, I do think remember that was saying, that was the the recordings down in ez right it may like, have been ed's yeah yeah but i remember saying to him okay carl you're going to be working are you excited working with you two? He goes, oh my God, yes. Are they your favorite? Yep, they're my favorite band. I can't believe I'm going to work with you two. I say, take that feeling right now, put it in a bottle and put the stopper on because there are going to be times during the recording where you will need to take that bottle out and take a big sniff of that feeling because yeah. you are going to, you know, and that's something that I absolutely try and hold true to myself. You know, because you can get worn down into thinking it's a job. And with you two, more than anything, it can become that. Because they're, 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 they're so, you know, you need the patience of a saint, you know. And, and I've learned a lot from them, as they've learned from me, they would say. You know, so, yeah, it's, it, but it's not annoying. It's just, you know, it's, it's what you have to do with them. And if you realize that, you know, when you go in that, oh, my God, this is, you know, you too, one of my favorite ever bands. Like, like, and, and Carl said to me, look, you know, that's, uh, you're right, Steve. Fucking can't stand it. But I'm going <laughs> to, because, you know, Edge will keep you going. And then until two in the morning, then Bono wants you there at nine and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, next question. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um Okay, let's see. Things are changing quickly over here with the upvoting. <laughs> uh, all right. Jazz Cool Cat, this is currently our most upvoted question. Jazz Cool Cat asks, what if an artist asked to record an album and he wants it to sound like it was in the 80s? So maybe if you got a current one, current artist. I, I, it sounded like it does in the 80s. Uh, well, what is sound? What was the eighties? Are you talking about, you know, some some of the 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 you know Boston was in the eighties. Def Leppard was in the eighties. Spandau Ballet mm -hmm. was in the eighties. Thriller was in the eighties. Uh, was that Thriller? Thriller. That was an eighties record. Thriller was. I was just about to say that Thriller was in the eighties, and my fucking Tin Can records were in the eighties. Which eighties do you mean? Um, I I I, th I think as a producer, one of the things you 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 are most scared about is when someone comes in with a record and says, "I want my drums to sound like this," or "I want my album to sound like this." I, I, and and there, there are ways you can get. I've I've been very lucky that I in my you know, again, even pre-production for me is talking. Pre-production is not necessarily going through the music, which, although it's sometimes, but I don't like having things too, too organized, you know, then you're, 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 
if you're managing, if you have time in the studio to be creative, I don't want it to just be a faithful reproduction of what a band does. Mm. You know, that's boring. I mean, I would like it to have something that has a special quality that, 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 and, and, and normally, very often, that special quality can come out of a little bit of craziness, a little bit of, of no planning, you know. Um, so, I, uh, oh, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> calm down, Steve. What were we talking about? Basically, what, what, if if a band comes in, you you were oh yeah 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 the idea get there, of, they're of, saying they want their record to sound a particular way. Like for it doesn't even have to be the eighties, mm -hmm. but if they have yeah, a, really yeah, yeah. a preconceived a notion, way is it, you 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 try and and use the um you know the 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 the, 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 the sucking their dick method of but you're such a good band you should sound like yourself. <laughs> you know that's mm -hmm. <laughs> right. that. Maybe a a, a a a little way of swerving it, but you never you never dismiss them. Like you know, you should say yeah 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 yeah. I you know I agree, but um, you know I I can dial in the sound of 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 the the first psychedelic furs album if you want. Let's go back in time to Rack Studios in 1979 and um, get a tape machine and you know now you can. So, so you're already at a loss, I think, if you if you start thinking like that, and and also, it's impossible when you get a sound to make that admission to to, to say that this is what it's going to be like because it's not finished. Yeah, you know, well, what one of the things I, I would never ever reference I would never listen to other records in the studio and my way of thinking and it sounds stupid now but it absolutely made sense at the time was that if we listen to other records while we're making our records our record will never sound as good because it's not finished you know yeah so and and the idea of, of of listening to a record to get a sound was just I would I would stop that at the pass I would say, no, you can't, you, that's not, you know, we are looking at the wrong things. Yeah. We are not looking at the things that we need to be looking at to make your record successful. And the worst part is now that comes up a lot at the mixing stage, which is so much too late that it's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't tell you the yeah. number of people who want me to make them sound like 99 Problems, even if it's a rock band. And it's, yeah. but but it's also it's about context i think that like the two examples i can think of off the top of my head are when i started mixing that um the black sabbath record there was this talk about trying to capture the spirit of the first couple records and you think right. if you haven't heard those records in a long time you think oh man yeah they're great they are the thinnest smallest sounding records ever but they're amazing but you don't yes. want to make it sound like that. You just want it to be reminiscent of that. And the, another sort of the opposite version of that is that like when, well, it's actually sort of the same thing. When Back in Black came out, I remember thinking, this is the heaviest record I've ever heard in my life. Right. And you listen to it now and it's so clean and it's amazing, but it's not yes. heavy at all. It's almost a pop record. Well, I would say never has a drummer hit the drum so quietly as Black Sabbath did on paranoid exactly or any of those, you know. it talk about jazz drummers in a rock band i mean that's yes. the epitome of yes. it yeah but it look we you know i know damn those musicians they don't know anything <laughs> <laughs> no they do they do but i think i think you got of to the core of it very of quickly by saying which 80s because what people are hearing is so different that you there you can't the words mean nothing. It's like dancing about architecture, as they say. Yes, absolutely. And I've just filled. This is my last. Oh, last little bit. All right. Well, well, so, well I've, I've tried to make right. the tea bag, tea bag work for th for three cups. Good God! <laughs> oh my God! Isn't That's that very terrible? thrifty of you? Well, let's <laughs> say a uh, very important question for the both of you. Uh, this yeah. is from Paul Bonfiglio. And Paul asks for Steve and Andrew, 
How long do you steep your tea? <laughs> oh, uh, well, I'm normally a coffee drinker. Um, uh, but obviously, I'm going to, it's now 4.15 a.m. Um, so if I drink another coffee, I'll just be wide awake. So I, I see, I, so the only tea, I don't drink tea with milk or anything. I just drink herbal tea like this mint tea, and I do leave the bag in while I drink it. Yep, yeah, herbal I would so, leave in. Yeah, Definitely. yeah, 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 yeah. Black tea, the optimum time is supposed to be three minutes. I go two minutes 30. Two minutes 30? On ah. a black tea. It's just a thing. We set the timer, just, you scoop it out. Sometimes we forget to set the timer, but yeah, two minutes okay. 30. There you go. You don't just sing an early Beatles song. No. No, <laughs> <laughs> because that would be about two minutes thirty. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Okay. Give me another question. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, all right. Uh, so Casey G asks or says, uh, one record I don't think you get enough credit for is Soul Album from The Lots. It's a peculiar record, so so out of step with what was happening at the time, but that's what makes it so special. By my count, you were the fifth. Sixth no. or seventh producer to work I think with I'm them. The seventh producer. Yeah, okay. it was uh, the the Lars. Well, you know, they're the only band in history who have had a box set released, even though they've only had one album out. Um, they, they, well, people know there she goes. Even if they don't know the original, they know the sixpence none the richer mm -hmm. version. Right. You know, it's a classic song. It's uh, but but the whole album is a brilliant album. I mean, they, they uh, you know, I, I think Noel Gallagher would say without the Lars, there would be no Oasis. Um, the guy was just an incredible uh, um, talent and, but again, that this was, it was just, he had it in his head how that record should be. And if at any point, it didn't. Uh, this sounds so weird. I mean, honestly, Andrew, you and and you know, you you and Mark, you wouldn't understand this. But if at any point during the recording, it didn't sound like he wanted it to sound, he would start again. Hmm. And he was such a power, you know. And it was, no, it's not right. It's not right. We need to do it again. And um, it it was the most. <laughs> it was just crazy. You know, and um, okay, one very quick story to show you the craziness. You know, on, 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 on the mixing desk, on the SSL, you've got three buttons for three different sets of speakers. Yeah. You've got the big speakers. You've got, I think, three. Yeah. You've got three, three options. You press each button. Yeah, you get your main, your mini, your of, alt mini. Yeah. So what, what, what we had, the studio at Eden Studios in, in London, we had the, the big speakers, the small speakers, and then the third button was actually, I don't know why it was, um, what it was. It was a set of speakers on the carpet behind the studio pointing away that were not being used, but they'd not been unplugged, right? You get the scenario. So I'm in there and I'm, and I'm flipping between the speakers and I go to the third button by mistake. And he goes, that's it. That's the sound. <laughs> The speakers on the floor pointing away on the car. That's how I want my record to sound, you know. And and it was, I don't know. It was, uh, and then of course he's the only artist ever in history when the album came out, he basically um, he rejected it. He said, "This is shit. <laughs> my own album is terrible." And he, he half-heartedly went out on the road and promoted it. And people who saw them live loved it and said, well, your album's great. You know, I don't get what you're saying, but I get what he was saying, you know. And, um, and, it, and it wasn't, and it was just, it's, they are brilliant songs. The album was not as big as it should have been. And I put that down to a production. You know, I, I don't think, but, but, you have to meet the producer at least 5% along the way. I don't know. It, it, it was not, um, no, it wasn't so great, but that was life. Well, and they're just no, artists I love it. I like that. 
you know. And he's he's never made another album though. And he he was so talented that if he just you know, and he's just about made enough money from that song to not need to make another album as well. You know, because it's one of those six figure songs. Yeah. You know, because it's um yeah. A six figure song. Yeah, a six figure song. You know what I mean by that, yeah. right? If you write write that song, you you know, you're in for a you know, couple of adverts, you know. Yeah. A couple of movies. <laughs> yes, yeah, you got a six figure song. Anyway, that's the Lars. I mean, I could write, you know, and there probably will be a chapter on the Lars. Yeah, well, and we and we talked about him pretty extensively in part one, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. Next question. I have nine right. minutes. I think I'm going to go to bed at 4.30. All right, then. Great, great. That's all right. That, that gives me that's a two-hour. Okay, so uh, another popular question here uh, from Richard Christie. Um, could you please share your experience working on Peter Gabriel 3? Oh, Richard. Um, well, well, we did speak quite a bit about that during part one, just if you want to oh, say something. Not, yeah, yeah. To, just, not to not answer. So we can yeah, do yeah, another yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did, didn't we? I mean, yeah. it was, you know, it was the first album I really ever worked on that was not an album from start to finish. It was the first time I worked with someone who was older than me. It was the first time I worked with someone that wasn't from the punk era. Um, even though for me, as I've always said, punk is an attitude, not music. Peter had that attitude, which was the most important thing. Um, and that pretty much lots of table tennis, considering it is one of the most depressing albums you will ever hear. There was so much joy and fun in the making. Mm -hmm. There you go. Next there question. You, go. You, see that, you see, Andrew, Mark, if I'd made my answers like that i would have got through all the questions <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> blah 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 blah. well we'll, we'll try to get through <laughs> no. we'll try to get through another couple one thing also i want to say because xtc one of my favorite bands there <laughs> is a fantastic documentary that it used to be on youtube it probably still is of uh doing towers of london at, xtc at the manor at the manor mm. stock there is the only pond. one video there is only one video and that was uh, and it's on YouTube. It's such bad quality. The but U it's uh, brilliant. Uh, BBC, I think, have lost the tape. It was made by BBC Bristol. There is only one. It's in six parts. XTC at the Manor. Yeah. It called me the fifth member of the band. Um, it was the re. It was saying the recording of Towers of London. It was a re-recording. We didn't actually use it. Um, but it's it's. Uh, you actually get to see me. Yeah. Pretty much with the same gestures but with a bit more of a plummy voice i've realized <laughs> that oh i'm a little bit more like this you know a bit more and, uh, well you know you were out in the country in a big mansion so. in those days in that yeah it just, <laughs> just yeah and there is but, a fantastic uh, scene of, of richard stocking the pond for a party I yes well it was the whole show was was you know you're not allowed to have adverts on the bbc but yeah. this was richard's way of advertising virgin on the BBC yeah. by making a show about making a record, but really it was about, it was the Richard Branson show. But yes, the manor, which cost Richard Branson 25,000 pounds. I always remember. <laughs> oh, that good old property debate. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, all right. There you go. Okay, Mark. Okay. We <laughs> got, we got okay. six minutes. Six all right. Minutes. Uh, top voted one from Phineas. Acoustically, do you have a favorite room? Oh, um, well, I, I love the stone room at the townhouse, um, mm -hmm. which no one ever used for things until I went there. You know, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely, you know, it was it was like no one did what I until I went to the stone room at the townhouse. I also loved Rack. I did some great records in the old schoolhouse at Rack. Uh, in New York, um, I think as a as a... As a physical structure, I think the power station or whatever it's now called, is it still there? What's it called now? Isn't that the one that Berkeley bought? Or am I yes. getting that confused? I uh, no, that's power station. I, yeah, so it still exists. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not called the power station. What's it called? God, I've worked there since. I mean, I haven't, I've been there loads of times they since. It was, I thought, it, I thought the they retained the Berkeley. name and added something it, to it. Like the whole idea, you've got this, it's in a round and so you've got your big wooden live room and then 
outside you've got these little uh, isolation rooms. So you can have everyone, if you're playing as an ensemble, you can have people with eye contact, but perfect separation. I mean, it's just a great, um, or you could open up the, 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 the booths. You've got like four booths around the outside. So you have the bass, guitar, keyboards, you know, and a singer mm -hmm. in, in each of the booths. And you can have your big drums, you know, the power station, that big drum sound, which I sort of bastardized with Marshall Crenshaw when I did mm -hmm. the Marshall Crenshaw album in there. Exactly. But anyway, also, there also spoken about in part one. Also, For people who want to yes. want to know about that, <laughs> but but yeah, I, I you know I and also I used to love a, a studio with a good table tennis table. That was my thing. <laughs> Next question, come on, here we go. Okay, um, what is your? Do you have a favorite record? Oh, do I have? A, oh my god, do I have a favorite record? Um, it would have to go right back. Um, no, I had terrible taste when I was young. No, I don't really have a favorite record. Uh, I, I used to listen. I, I mean, I like bands like Ten Years After when I was when I was young. Well, is there anything you know. recent that you love? Just recent. just something you want to shout out to? Because oh, it's well, great. you know, as, as um, not really. I haven't listened yeah. to much. Well, I, 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 I live in Indonesia, and I'm sort of part of their music culture right. i could say oh e1 falls i could say uh dewa or or dang doot which is a style of music that because you know i i'm 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 immersed into this um into this world here so i'm i'm not really a, other than watching football i'm not really a west and and following the the american uh, political <laughs> shit thing show, i think it's uh, yeah. Yeah. Looking yeah, for. Yeah, shit show, yeah well I'm, uh, yeah. all right so well, music for me is part of you know i love this because this is my culture now. Well, yeah. I'm going to shout out three things only because I don't usually have any time to listen to music ever, but lately I've been writing lots of code for any, it doesn't matter why. So I've been right. listening so to music. So the Alan Johannes record Hum, I think is one of the most extraordinary records I've ever heard. It's just incredible. Oh, okay. Beautiful, beautiful record. Um, Josh Klinghoffer, recently ex Chili Peppers, but also played with PJ Harvey and some people like that. He's done right. two albums that are basically solo records, but under the name Plural One, which are fantastic, really, really good. And the third one just flew out of my head. So there you go. So we just plug oh, those two. Oh, Andrew, you're so current. You're so well, I'm so not. I'm usually not at all. But I love the fact that I found... Re oh, and the other one is a band that at the moment I'm still... I don't know the catalog terribly well, and it's a big catalog. But uh, Big Thief is very cool. Big the songwriting Thief? is incredible. Oh, no, I don't know Big Thief. Either. Yeah, she is... She's very cool guitar player and a great great singer and writer so those oh, two things are all re well, relatively recent boy did you beat me on that question that's all right <laughs> well look that can't be the last Wait, question though that one. so let's get another one in come I, on come on another Mark. question I think it was a good one just gave us a lot of good music to go away on the break with yeah <laughs> uh Okay. Yeah, when we finish up with steve i'll do some housekeeping afterwards to explain what's going on with the schedule and all that kind of stuff great good. okay yeah and Steve, if you could give any, well, um, maybe we'll get to that. Uh, you've worked in London, the East Coast US, and the West Coast US. What are the differences? You've worked everywhere. So what are the oh, differences? Okay. The, the differences? Uh, difference is, is that um, in the East Coast US, studios are booked pretty much on a, a studio day is cut into either two or three segments. And um, you, back in the day to lock out a studio, you'd have to have a lot of money, really a lot of money. Um, so you would do, uh, you know, the day or the night. Uh, and, and, and New York studios are, you know, I, I, Manhattan studios, I don't, I don't ever, other, and there's one main reason I don't like them so much is that, I mean, it's a stupid thing, but I, I, I really do believe that, that if you're doing an album, it's a bit like family and that whole thing that, that you eat together, a family that eats together is a strong family. And I go to a New York studio and I say, um, you know, that they say, we've, that they show me a menu book this thick. 
Now, for me, I don't want to make my choice with my food. I'm thinking about choices all the time. I want my dinner, right? So I've, if, if we're very lucky enough to have PDs um, like that, I will say to the band, can we pull our PDs and give it to someone to cook? And then we sit down together and we have a meal and we can talk about the work if we want, or we can talk about something else. But the idea of having to choose and, you know, the bass player wants Chinese, the singer wants Italian, he wants this, he wants that plastic knives and forks, eating on your lap in the green room, which is a fucking small space because it's New York. You know, you give me a, a chef and a kitchen, we go in, that for me is the most important part. That is like, and you don't have to think about what you want to have. You know, someone is doing the thinking for the food. You are doing, and, and I know it sounds like, oh yeah, of course he can afford it with big budgets, but you know, back in the day, you would have PDs. And, and if you could pull them all, it, and it's not, a, it's not a false economy. It's actually a real, for me, it was a very important part of, um, of, of what I found, what kept me sane during an album. Mm. Because every day, twice a day, having to think what restaurant you were going to go to and then what, you know, it was just too just too much thinking it distracts the entire group too, because everybody's talking about it and thinking about it for 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, different thing. Yeah. You know, if it's like someone says dinner time, seven o'clock, great, let's go. Oh, I wonder what we're having today. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you're in, and you're looking forward to this great thing. You're never looking forward to something that comes in a polystyrene fucking, you know, you don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you anyway, play studios. Yeah. It's a given that you, you're going to eat. I mean, not all of them, but most of them had a place to eat and that yeah. was part of it. Yeah, but, but New York, you know, because of space, no you, New York no. studio has a, has a kitchen. And, uh, and even the, you know, the big, the studios in, in, in LA, I don't think any of them have a kitchen. You know, they have more space and you can go and sit outside under the nice palm trees. Yeah, but it's still a menu book that thick. Away. It's still a menu that thick. And they're very proud of it. I go, no, I don't, I don't want to chew. Yeah. All I want is my dinner. Next question. Oh, Come on, we're last going question. Over time. Oh, I know. I, I, <laughs> I don't want to. Okay. Um, well, let's see. So have you worked with, with many assistants? Oh, I, again, I've been very lucky. I started out as an assistant. I understand assistance. I love assistance more than anything. Um, without assist, you know, um, they're fantastic. What makes a great assistant? Um, reading the room. Absolutely reading the room. Um, you want an assistant to have a little bit of a personality. You don't want an assistant to have a huge personality. You want an assistant to be quiet when he needs to be quiet. Just someone who reads the room. I mean, that's, you know, I don't need to pontificate. If you understand what I mean, if you read the room mm -hmm. and, um, you know, say, take Flood, fantastic guy, great friend. You know, why is his name Flood? Because when he was an assistant, he used to basically keep asking people if they wanted tea. You want tea? You want tea? And he, someone nicknamed him Flood because it would be a flood of tea that would, you know, literally he was well, flooding with tea. And and apparently the other assistant was nicknamed Drought. <laughs> so, <laughs> Is that true? Yes. Alan Mulder cleared that up for us. So, Oh, that's so funny. I hope that's and, true. Yeah. But, you know, where is Drought now? <laughs> drought is not making records. Right. <laughs> You know, and so, so you know, and uh, and also, to to be honest, when you look at a, 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 a studio culture where you have the assistant, the engineer, and the producer, it's the only culture where, if you take a corporation where you have the CEO and the post room, they never interact, right? Mm -hmm. But in a studio, you've got like 
maybe the multi-millionaire producer, the you know earning a good middle-class salary engineer, and you have the and you have the assistant who is on minimum wage. Probably, they are interacting together, mm-hmm. and um, you don't get that in other structures of life. The rich put themselves in this little bubble, you know. And um, and I, I and I I don't like that. I think it it it's you know I love studio culture. Studio culture for me was everything, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and I and I love it. And it and it gave me my break. And Andrew Sheps, this may be the last time we ever speak. Well, why would that be? <laughs> You're going to lose my number. Is there Stephen a and I are going to talk more, coming? but you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to miss you. Well, well, we'll we'll do this again. And you we only know, I, I, look, I, I, if a, if we only got through about half the questions anyway. So I know. Put we'll, me on. Put me on um, first reserve. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Or fifth reserve. Fifth reserve. Awesome. Fifth reserve. Know, but, um, All right. No, this was this will, was great. I'm really. It, it, I feel like know, we I kind of know it, each other me, a little too. No, 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 no. What's it, it's great for me is it it. it crystallizes things in my own mind and it and it gives me some peace of mind so i am getting um i'm getting as much out of this that i hope the people are getting out of it you know in a way it's a it's a weird cathartic thing for me it's um well when you see my bill you'll find out whether it was actually worth it or not but yes oh (laughs) the therapist (laughs) yes no no it's it's really important I, i think that's one of the things i love about teaching and doing seminars is having to figure out ways to not just put it into words, because whatever, you could always come up with a way to say it, but to actually find ways to convey what you feel is important is amazing. No, I absolutely was against, you know, I I was very snobbish about, you know, those who can't teach. And I absolutely don't go with that now. I think there's, it's important that people like us, especially people like us who, who sort of straddle the old and the new, you know, because the, 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 the mindset of the old is something that you can't learn from a book necessarily, you know, um, because it is all mindset of how people were making records in those days. And, and um, so, so it's important because there is stuff still, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think there were things and you wouldn't still be doing what yeah. you're doing. If you didn't think there was something that we had to offer still. And for me, it's not so much making new records anymore. It's it's imparting some sort of of wisdom in hopefully a uh, an entertaining way. Very entertaining. And I think what's important is that what's important about music and recorded music transcends the technology. It transcends everything that changes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so. on that. Andrew Sheps, you should put your photograph on your WhatsApp state on on your WhatsApp profile. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think you're one of like or, two people I speak to on WhatsApp. So, oh, you don't because oh, what Americans don't use WhatsApp whatsoever. WhatsApp mm. is the great is is by far the best messaging system. All right. Well, I I will put my I will put my favorite mm. picture of myself, which is me standing in front of a tractor. I will. Put that one on. There you go. There you go. Put yeah. your, and then it'll make me happy. Whenever I see that, I'll go, oh, well, t- I'll, uh, I'll WhatsApp Andrew Phipps. Well, and thank look, you so you much again. You have a again. wonderful evening. It's been great. I've loved these 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 three um, these three journeys into my night. And uh, and look, I don't want to, you know, I'll, I'll just say if you ever want, because it's good for me as well. But um, And Mark Abrams, I think we're friends on Facebook now, aren't we? Yes. <laughs> Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so, I will, so I will see you there. Yeah, I will <laughs> see you there. And thank you so much for all your help. And yes, and Andrew, you are now gonna. Yeah, I'm. I'm so fucking nosy. I want to know what you're gonna. Well, be you saying. can hang around if you want. I mean, it's nothing yeah. that exciting. I know. No, I have to yeah. go. Will I keep my fucking voice quiet? No, I won't. So I'll, <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. And I, I do have to go. All right, you well, have an excellent you. sleep. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll speak we, to you later. Yes. All right. Okay. Thanks so much, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, See cheers. Bye, Steve. boy. Bye. 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 <laughs> leave. Oh, I thought he'd never leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a fantastic way to wrap up the year. So, Mark, first of all, thank you for all of your incredibly hard work all this year, Thanks making these shows me. happen. Yeah. 
Um, and just so everybody knows the schedule, we're taking December off because I have to take December off just because I have to. Um, but we already have people lined up in January. As of right now, the first show is going to be on the 11th, and that's with Eric Valentine. And we tentatively have uh, Fraser T. Smith for the week after. So that should be quite fantastic. Um, and if that changes, obviously, you'll get emails and all sorts of things to help you with that. Uh, the other piece of news is that obviously the podcast is still happening and this week uh, the Ken Scott interview comes out. So if you want to listen to that one while you're driving aimlessly in your car because you're not allowed to actually stop the car and get out of it anywhere, then you feel free to do that. Um, and maybe most excitingly, is that a, that's not a word. Anyway, it is now. Um, the biggest news is that another uh, Between Two Shores will be coming out this week. Featuring our very good friend from last week, John Paterno. And uh, it's, I think it's pretty funny. So hopefully everyone yeah. will enjoy that. <laughs> Mark, you got anything? Uh, no, I think that that's about it. We had um, a new video with Nipsey Hussle come out last week. Jakir's series continues on Friday. And that'll be going through the new year. So yeah, a lot of content. great, great, great content. So... There you go. Awesome. Have a great December, everybody. Get vaccinated when you can. And until then, wear a fucking mask. And that's all I got. I do have one more thing. Oh, one Andrew, more thing. thank you for doing this. Thank you for keeping us all entertained during lockdown and throughout this entire year. And thanks for continuing to do it. Well, thanks. I'm really great. happy to have the opportunity. It's been amazing to talk to all these people, too. I, I look at the list, and it's kind of scary and humbling. It's, it's just incredible. Yeah. And it continues. It continues. So next year will be season two. Yes. Awesome. All right. Great. I'm going to go to the thanks for watching screen because that's what we do at the end of these things. So we're both going to wave. <laughs> and at some point, I'm going to awkwardly turn off the mic and switch the picture. <laughs>